quote, War destroys all systems that sustain and nurture life, familial, economic, cultural, political, environmental, and social. Once war begins, no one, even those nominally in charge of waging war, knows what will happen, how the war will develop, how it can drive armies and nations towards suicidal folly. There are no good wars. None. That is a quote from former war correspondent Chris Hedges, who has covered wars all over the world, including in Central America, the Middle East, Africa, and the Balkans. The quote is from his new book called The Greatest Evil is War. It's a book in which Chris Hedges reflects on his time covering wars and reflects on the wars of both today and of yesterday. Chris Hedges writes a column for Sheer Post, and he has a show called The Chris Hedges Report, which is on the Real News Network. Chris Hedges, it is a great pleasure to welcome you back to this radio program. Thanks, Mitch. We should also mention that now that RT shut down, I've moved to Substack. So it's chrishedges.substack.com. Uh, and, and and that's interesting and also interesting that you're with the Real News Network. So you, you now have a, another television program. But of course, this was after RT, R, RT closed in part, maybe entirely because of pressure from the U.S. government. How, how have things been for you since then? Well, the 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 uh, show, which is broadcast out of Baltimore on the Real News, as you mentioned, as well as the column at Shearpost are funded by subscri- Substack subscribers. Um, and uh, that's just become a platform that I've turned to, as Matt Taibbi did, and Glenn Greenwald, Patty Smith, and all sorts of others, uh, which is subscriber-based. Uh, and it works and allows me to continue to do my work. Um, the uh, RT show, which was called On Contact, uh, was primarily focused on writers, and I was very conscientious about reading the books as a writer myself. Uh, but once RT was uh, shut down, YouTube took it upon themselves to uh, disappear all of six years of archives of my show, although not one show had anything to do with Russia. Uh, but quite a few of them had a lot to do with Julian Assange and civil liberties and permanent war and all the kinds of things the ruling class doesn't want discussed. In, in your book, the, the new, the newest book, it is interesting you write that your experience in 2003 with the Iraq war, when your denunciation of that war and how that severed, uh, made things complicated for you with the New York Times, who you reported for at the time, was very different than when you went out on RT and, and also said that the, Russia's invasion of Ukraine uh, was illegal and, and wrong. It's it's interesting comparison what happened between those two. Well, I only had six days before it was shut down, but during the six days they didn't say anything, unlike the New York Times, which gave me a written, a formal written reprimand and told me I was no longer allowed to speak about the Iraq war or the calls to invade Iraq, although I... Uh, had been the Middle East bureau chief for the newspaper, spent seven years in the Middle East, much of that time in Iraq, and I'm an Arabic speaker. Now, I don't uh, have any illusion that Moscow uh, would have permitted that kind of a stance, a public stance. Uh, so I, I already had assumed that my show would be canceled, uh, given my opposition to the invasion, my very public opposition to the invasion of Ukraine, but yeah, I had a, I had those six days when they didn't say anything. So, <laughs> did did you hear anything afterwards? As 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 a, a response might have been coming. No, uh, I I don't. I think we know what the response would have been. Um, uh, but at that point, you know, the whole network imploded, as it did in the UK and Germany and everywhere else. It was off the air, and and I think the reason was that with the invasion of Ukraine, a lot of people turned to RT to at least hear. The Russian perspective. I, I covered war for 20 years. I can tell you both sides lie like they breathe, uh, but uh, it was shutting down that perspective, I think, is, uh, and, and they'd long harbored uh, uh, desires to uh, deplatform RT. We know from the 2017 Director of National Intelligence Report, it's about 22 pages long, so about seven pages are dedicated to RT, and I think they reveal their hand in that report because uh, they don't complain about Russian propaganda, or certainly that's not the examples that they cite. 
the examples they cite is that RT is giving voice to Black Lives Matter activists, anti-fracking activists, anti-imperialists, uh, critics of the Democratic Party, third party candidates, and that's what they didn't want. Chris Hedges, in 2003, you wrote the book War is a Force That Gives Us Meaning. Obviously, that book was about war. It's my understanding, while war and conflict is always part of what you're writing about, you hadn't really written a book that took on war directly for almost 20 years and until now with this latest book of uh, uh, of yours. Again, uh, that is... Uh, called the uh, the great the greatest evil is war. Why, why this book now? The greatest evil is war. Well, I the first book is really drawn out of my own experience in war in various war zones around the globe, uh, and it it was very personal. It was very difficult to write, uh, and the book did extremely well. And then, of course, all the big commercial publishers wanted me to write another book on war because uh, all they can see is dollar signs. Uh, and I didn't want to dilute the quality of that book. I said what I wanted to say, so I refused. I turned down those contracts. I also didn't want to spend the rest of my life writing about war uh, like Rick Atkinson. He writes good stuff, but it's just endless, you know, World War II stuff. Uh, so um, I, I did do a book with Leila Al Arian where we it was it was published out of a long investigative piece in the Nation magazine where we interviewed 50 veterans from uh, the the war in Iraq uh, and talked about atrocities that they had either uh, committed or you know certainly uh, been part of or had witnessed. Um, uh, but that was done out of that was essentially the amplification of a large investigative piece. I did a quick book uh, called What Every Person Should Know About War, but that was directed at high school students, was modeled uh, after a book that came out after World War I, uh, that in the lead up to World War II was actually removed, blacklisted, removed from the shelves by a lawyer who was defending or uh, attempting to get compensation for a client who had been grievously wounded in the war, and he just, as he began to explore the reality of World War one realized that it bore no relation to the version of the war that was disseminated to the public. So he wrote this book, what, what every uh, 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 what every man should know about war, or something like that. Uh, Shapiro was his name, and I modeled this book on that. So it was all drawn from documents that the army publishes, psychological studies. I got one of four copies in circulation of the. Uh, combat medicine textbook that surgeons use on a battlefield, etc. Uh, but yes, I shied away from what I had done in War is a Force That Gives Us Meaning. Uh, and then uh, I was approached, I had written quite strongly, because I was in Eastern Europe in 1989, uh, covering the revolutions in East Germany, Czechoslovakia, and Romania. So I was acutely aware of the promises that had been made to Moscow, to Gorbachev, uh, that NATO would not expand beyond the borders of a unified Germany. I had listened to all of the uh, promises of a peace dividend that we wouldn't have to divert such staggering resources towards the permanent war economy now that the Cold War was over. Uh, all of the uh, Sovietologists, I mean, George Kenner and everyone, uh, uh, realized that the expansion of NATO was folly especially since Moscow really wanted to build a security alliance with the United States and uh, Europe. Uh, and then, of course, the whole NATO itself. NATO was formed uh, to prevent Soviet expansion into Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, it, it rendered itself redundant, and it just shows you how naive we all were, uh, because there was billions to be made in expanding NATO. There was the hubris of the U.S. that saw the old Soviet empire is uh, uh, broken and, and that they could do whatever they wanted. Uh, and so was I wrote a column called Chronicle of a War Foretold. I mean, we all knew it was coming. It was predictable. Uh, Burns, who was in uh, the Soviet Union, actually was a memo in WikiLeaks that he published uh, saying, you know, don't uh, stoke a conflict over Ukraine. Uh, it will bait Russia into a war uh, or at least a proxy war. So. Uh, it was all predictable. It doesn't defend what Russia did, the uh, invasion of a country that doesn't 
directly threaten you, as we did in Iraq, is under post-Nuremberg laws, a criminal war of aggression. Uh, but, you know, like the Versailles Treaty uh, that led to world, the humiliation of Germany and the rise of fascism and World War II, there are historical antecedents that we should understand. Uh, you know, to understand is not to condone, of course, but we need to understand. And so uh, City Lights and uh, Seven Stories Press, and I initially said no, <clears throat> and then I went back and looked over the various essays, lectures that I had written over the last two decades on war. It was quite extensive, um, and they came back again, and I put this book together. It's, there's very little uh, about myself. That's the difference of between this and War is a Force that gives us meaning. But I did a lot of interviews with uh, people who have come out of combat, a, a woman who uh, worked in a mortuary unit, she was the Marine Corps, uh, Thomas Young, who I went out and visited, uh, who was uh, quadriplegic and uh, uh, was going to unhook his uh, feeding tubes uh, and commit suicide, and then I helped him. I had to, he couldn't hold a pen even. I had to hold a pen for him to write this last letter to Dick and Cheney that Ch to Cheney and uh, Bush that he that he dictated to me. Um, a father who lost a young son in the war. I mean, so uh, it, it's it's uh, interview heavy, and uh, but it, it it looks at various aspects of war um, uh, and and the consequences of war. Was is the war in Ukraine? Was that the impetus for this book? Was the impetus for the book because the, I had written three columns on the war that caught the attention of these editors. So that was the impetus. And then it, it became, it's far more than, I mean, I do talk, I, those columns are in the book, but it's, uh, it's uh, a much broader kind of investigation of the enterprise of death that war is. War is not, uh, despite what Clausewitz said, politics by other means. Uh, it, it's, uh, it, 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 and you read that quote at the beginning, but it, it is really about the destruction, the obliteration of all systems that sustain and nurture life. Again, that quote that I, I started off with, you say there are no good wars, none. You continued on to say that includes World War II. What about defensive wars? What about approaching war? If you're, if you're, Ukra if you're being invaded by another country, if you're Ukraine or if you're Iraq in 2003, well, that I was in Sarajevo during the war. I mean, we were surrounded by the Serbs. We were hit with 300 shells a day, uh, constant sniper fire, four to five dead a day, two dozen wounded a day. Uh, we understood, those of us who were in the besieged city, that if, uh, and it was literally surrounded by trenches. Uh, it was a kind of World War I experience. And then every couple months, some Muslim commander would get the bright idea of, uh, doing a night attack, literally rising up out of the trenches and running towards the Serbian machine guns with the same result as the Somme or anywhere else. The starbursts would go off to light up the sky in the middle of the night and you'd hear yells and then these people, would, these kids would be mowed down by machine guns. Um, but we knew that if they broke through the defenses, the Serbs broke through the defenses of the city, uh, a third of the city would be slaughtered and the rest would be driven into refugee or displacement camps. Now that wasn't conjecture because that's what they had done in the Drina Valley, that's what they'd done in Vukovar, that's what they'd... So we knew what would happen. Now at that point you will pick up a weapon uh, to uh, ensure your own survival and the survival of your family and community, but it doesn't save you from the poison of war. Um, the people who initially organized the defenses of Sarajevo were the gangsters who already had weapons and a kind of penchant for violence. And when they weren't shooting at Serbs, it was a very kind of uh, local affair at the beginning, through the past the barricades, they were bursting into the apartments of ethnic Serbs and looting them and often killing them. So you, you, know, you open that Pandora's box of war, you not only don't control it, uh, but you ingest the evil of war, even in a defensive war. So I write in the book about my uncle who served in the South Pacific, was very badly wounded, uh, came back and drank himself to death. Uh, the, 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 you, you can be pushed into a situation where uh, you employ violence uh, to defend yourself, as the Ukrainians are doing, uh, as the Iraqis did and the Afghans did, uh, but uh, you uh, 
you essentially uh, enter that distorted world of war where uh, those who are most efficient at killing uh, become ascendant on either side. And of course, what, the, what we got after World War II is the permanent war economy, which has destroyed the country. When you speak about your uncle, it reminds me of my grandfather who fought in World War II. He was on a glider that went into Normandy uh, on D-Day, and he never told us anything about it whatsoever. I'd, I'd pepper him with questions. Not only did he not tell us anything about that, he didn't tell my grandmother anything about that. We got no information from him about that. Not only did he not talk about that, he just didn't talk at all. He was the most laconic person I, I had ever met. And it wasn't until I interviewed a historian of World War II, and I, I, I relayed that same information to the historian who said, you know, that was one of the most dangerous missions that there were uh, to go into a glider uh, into enemy lines at the time. And it just made me think of the effects of war uh, on people. And, and you do write, Chris, in, in this uh, latest book of yours, The Greatest Evil is War, that you still wake up at night from, from, from nightmares. Well, anybody who's been in conflict, uh, been in war, has to deal with that uh, kind of residue of trauma, uh, which manifests itself. I mean, I, I will avoid incidents that I know will be uncomfortable for me. It's a cliche, but I don't like fireworks. It's not like I crawl under the table, but I don't like it. Um, I don't like crowds. Crowds uh, spook me. I don't go to movie theaters that have scenes of combat, not because the scenes are realistic. They're almost never realistic, but because the sound system is so uh, large that the, the sounds of the concussions are realistic enough that they're disturbing, but it mainly manifests itself in terms of nightmares, you know. What's triggering about crowds? Well, I've been in hostile crowds. I've been in crowds that have turned, not only turned, but turned on me. So um, I, I just don't like crowds, uh, uh, you know, or call them mobs, the potential of a crowd to become a mob. When, when did a crowd turn on you? What was, what happened? Oh, a couple of times. I mean, I, in, I covered the Falkland War out of Argentina, and then after they lost the war, uh, as a reporter, I was working for NPR. I was in, uh, in front of the Casa Rosada in the Plaza de Mayo, and the crowds uh, in, were t overturning cars and attacking press and uh, quite uh, severely uh, uh, injured a BBC crew, and then they turned on me, but I speak Spanish, and I said, soy aleman, soy aleman, I'm German, I'm German. So uh, in Algeria, a crowd turned on me, and I was actually protected by three or four young Algerians. So uh, I just, I, I, I have had to cover crowds that have been very uh, violent. I mean, have carried out attacks on targets, and a couple times I have been the target, so I think that has makes I just I don't like being in crowds. I don't go to concerts. Any large crowd I don't like. Chris Hedges, as a young man, man, you you went to seminary school. How how does a young man who goes to seminary school end up covering wars on almost all the continents of the world? Well, for, I've been a writer. I mean, so I had already published in the Christian Science Monitor, but I couldn't square the social activism of my father, who was. A World War II vet and a Presbyterian minister and involved in the anti-war movement, the civil rights movement, and the gay rights movement in the end, for which the church was not very forgiving. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> My uncle, his youngest brother, was gay. So uh, I, I, that social commitment was paramount, and you get fed this uh, noxious idea that somehow journalists are supposed to be objective or neutral. Uh, how can you be objective or neutral about injustice? Uh, and my second year at Harvard Divinity School, I ran into Robert Cox, who had been the editor of the Buenos Aires Herald. And Bob had published, uh, with the only newspaper in Argentina to do so, the names of the desaparecidos on the front page above the fold every day until he was himself arrested and is alive only. I think he's British citizen that the British government intervened to get him out. So he was at Harvard on a Neiman Fellowship that year, and we became very close. And I saw uh, you know, what journalism should be, what it can do. And that was a huge uh, inspiration for me. I took a year off. I studied 
Spanish at the Instituto de Idiomas in Cochabamba, Bolivia, run by the Marino Fathers. I freelanced uh, for the Washington Post and other people uh, covered, as I said, the Falcon War for NPR. And then uh, under heavy pressure from my parents, who were both seminary graduates, went back and finished my degree. It's a three-year degree. I had one year left. Uh, but it, as soon as the degree was over, I, I had not much money. I bought a one-way ticket to El Salvador to go cover the war. So that was how. People go into war for different reasons, but mine was really uh, driven by Orwell, by that idea that uh, the role of the press is to give a voice to those whose voices the dominant uh, uh, ruling elite is attempting to silence, in case of Central America, attempting to exterminate. Uh, and so that was how I entered war. You covered the civil war in El Salvador in the 1980s. <clears throat> this is a time when we have sort of a, a liberation theologists. Did, did you connect with them? Did you connect with that? Well, that's interesting because I actually <coughs> I wrote my senior thesis as a critique of liberation theology from the perspective of Niebuhr, who I was still uh, come out of, um, and, and it really it was... Uh, you know, the, the, I obviously the preferential option for the poor and the social gospel, all that kind of stuff I embrace. Uh, but if you really read liberation theology, there is a kind of fusion with Marxism and a justification for violence, which even then I couldn't embrace. Uh, so while I am sympathetic to much of liberation theology on that issue of violence, I break with them. Uh, and I also, uh, you know, I'm a good Calvinist. I don't think that human beings are perfectible or society is perfectible. I think that uh, the greatest battle is Primo Levi and others. Actually, it's in the Quran. Uh, the greatest battle is the struggle of the evil within us. Um, I'm actually teaching in a prison. I teach in the, uh, through Rutgers University, I teach in the uh, college credit courses in the New Jersey prison system, and i right now teaching Gulag Archipelago by Solzhenitsyn. But Solzhenitsyn, who was a captain in the Red Army, uh, and, and there, at one point uh, before he was sent to the Gulags, uh, the NKVD, the secret police, attempted to recruit him. He meditates on that. Could he, <clears throat> what would he have become with that kind of power? Um, we're all, and Primo Levi writes about this, I think, quite powerfully, that that line between the victim and the victimizer is razor thin. Um, so uh, those would be all disagreements I would have. Um, on the other hand, of course, uh, I gravitated in uh, Latin America and certainly in Central America to those who would have described themselves as coming out of the uh, the uh, uh, coming out of liberation theology because they were in the slums, they were in the poor areas. and. Uh, I think a lot of them actually didn't have a detailed understanding of liberation theology. I actually took a seminar with Gustavo Gutierrez when I was at Harvard, um, but they did great work, uh, and the kind of work that I admire and the kind of work that I believe that if you come uh, out of uh, the social gospel as I do, you, you stand, as James, the great theologian James Cohn said, with the crucified of the earth, um, that's what you do. So there was a kinship, although on a kind of intellectual level, there were some uh, caveats that I had in terms of liberation theology. Do you still hold those critiques concerning Marxism? Yes. I mean, I think Marx, uh, quite uh, probably better than anyone, along with Engels, understood the nature of capitalism and how capitalism works. Uh, but I don't, like Marx or the Jacobins, believe in the creation of the new man or the new woman. Uh, I, I don't think that uh, you know, wherever we should always strive towards uh, a just and, if you want to call it, utopian society with the understanding that we'll probably never get there. This is Max Weber's great essay, Politics as a Vocation, that is a constant kind of struggle uh, against injustice, against abuse, against exploitation, which will always be with us, and therefore we must always fight it. What's the critique with Marxism? That, 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 that's it, I'm sorry, that, that it... That it tries to per, per, per create a well, perfect society. Well, it believes in the perfectibility that yeah. you, I mean, the Jacobins tried this and ended up with a guillotine and in the Soviet Union it ended up with the gulags. Uh, you know, that uh, human, you know, this goes back to my theology. I mean, human sin is real. I mean, sin, you, or whatever you want to call it, 
uh, is uh, and 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 that it is a, you know even for those of us who seek to live a moral life, it's a constant struggle uh, to uh, to achieve uh, uh, you know or strive towards a kind of moral uh, perfection that is unattainable. Um, uh, and 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 if you look at fundamentalists or you look at totalitarian societies, they externalize evil. So evil is embodied in the other who must be eradicated. The Christian right does this. This is why I wrote a book called The uh, American Fascist, The Christian Right and the War in America. I didn't use the word fascist lightly. I think as people who saw on January 6th the connecting tissue between these uh, neo-fascist groups was this Christian fascism. Uh, but they externalize evil. So evil is embodied in the other, in Muslims, in, I don't know, homosexuals. I mean, they have a long list of people they want to get rid of. But once you externalize evil, then uh, you create uh, or, or you uh, essentially perpetuate uh, a kind of horror, a kind of society where uh, large segments of any population are rendered, are, are dehumanized, are, are seen as not human. So evil for you is real. Of course it's real. <laughs> Anybody who's been in war will tell you that. And this is based in, do you, do you think, in sort of a religious background or? No, I don't. I, 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 I think that Camus, who didn't consider himself religious, had certainly this sense and understanding uh, no, I don't think it has to be religious. I happen to have grown up with that kind of vocabulary and that training. Uh, but all sorts of people who don't consider themselves religious uh, certainly understand uh, the nature of evil. I mean, uh, there's a wonderful book, uh, Shielding the Flame. It's Hannah Kroll's interview with Marek Edelman, who's the deputy commander of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Who I think he was a bund. I think he considers himself an atheist. Uh, but he certainly uh, grapples with all of those questions, including the reality of human evil. You said anyone who has been in war would understand that evil is real. Is that is there something about being in war that's almost impossible to experience if you haven't been in it? Yeah, it's impossible to experience, and it's ultimately impossible to explain. And impossible to imagine. Yeah, probably. I mean, you know, you know, the, the thing is, there's so much uh, visceral uh, uh, war is so visceral in the sense of the fear which takes o takes over you at certain times. The the smells, the sounds. I mean, my hearing, like a lot of people who've been in conflict, is not particularly great. Um, so, and when you see images of war, like porn, you know, all of that is sanitized and washed away. So. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's. A, I mean, we work at it. I think those of us who come out of war and attempt to explain it, but ultimately, it, it is its own subculture. It is its own. It's hallucinogenic. I mean, you don't sleep. Uh, you're zipped up on adrenaline. You, you know, you see landscapes that are literally hallucinogenic. I mean, people's bodies blown apart. Um, you, you, you know, I even look back, I did it for 20 years, but I look back and I will sometimes wonder, did I see, did I actually see that uh, image? Um, because it's so foreign to a world not at war. And then there's a social collapse. I think many, many of us who haven't experienced war firsthand are, aren't as aware of. Sure. I mean, it's a Hobbesian universe. It's a, it's the disparity. It's those who have the weapons. So this disparity between those who have weapons and those who don't. Um, and those who have weapons in a place like Bosnia are God. They can kill with impunity, rape with impunity, steal with impunity. Uh, and, and if you don't have a weapon and you're not part of that uh, very narrow segment of the society, uh, then you're you're completely powerless. You don't have any power. Um, uh, there's a history, a novel by Elsa Morante, which is the Italian novelist, which is very good because it's about a single woman who she's actually raped by a German soldier, but and has a child. But it's about her and her child living uh, in uh, in Rome uh, at, during the Nazi occupation when they have no power. Um, but that's the experience you know, 98% of people experience in war, 
But of course, the experience that is disseminated by popular culture is uh, the experience of those who have the weapons. Most people who live in war don't, uh, that's not their experience of war. In your book, The Greatest Evil is War, you begin it by calling Russia's invasion of Ukraine a war crime. Was, was, that, was it important to begin there? Did <clears throat> I don't know if it was, I think I, will, I don't know if it was important. I mean, I put the three essays on Ukraine up front because I think because it's of the because it's current because it's dealing with uh, a situation in real time. That's why. Um, uh, and and then the the book then looks at all these various facets of war, including this essay, the pimps of war. These people like the Kagans and all the neocons who, Elliot Abrams, who I had to deal with in Central America, uh, who, uh, it doesn't matter how many disasters they orchestrate, uh, because they're funded by the permanent war economy. All these institutes, Brookings and everybody else, are primarily funded by the war industry. They just perpetuate one fiasco after another because it's not a new idea. War is a business. It's a very lucrative business. Um, that's why the stock has skyrocketed in Raytheon and everywhere else because of Ukraine, um, that it, it always has been a business. And these war profiteers and pimps of war are those who are quite willing to sacrifice our kids or Ukrainian kids. It doesn't really matter uh, as long as they make money. Is this an American war too? Well, it's a proxy war. I mean, it's uh, so the Ukrainians wouldn't have been able to sustain it without... Fifteen billion dollars worth of military and humanitarian assistance from the U.S. Uh, it's very cynical because the the it's it's uh, eventually they're going to have to talk. Uh, uh, I mean, even Henry K. It also could spiral out of control. We're antagonizing a state that has nuclear weapons. Uh, I never thought I'd see the day when I would agree with Henry Kissinger. Uh, but he's right uh, that uh, negotiations have to start soon before it does spiral out of control. Uh, and that will include uh, probably trading land for peace. These are Kissinger's words, not mine. Yes, Kissinger is a war criminal. I get it. But he also understands uh, geopolitics. And he was part of that Cold War uh, clique that attempted to essentially make sure that Washington was closer to Beijing or closer to Moscow than Beijing and Washington were to each other. That was always Cold War policy, which has now been obliterated. What, what we have done is essentially drive Moscow into the arms of uh, China. And of course, they're about to start joint military ex exercises. This was all the keeping uh, Moscow and Beijing from forming a tight alliance was the primary goal of Cold War, one of the primary goals of Cold War policy. And, and then we've got the whole, uh, we're sacrificing Europe. A German industry is shutting down. Uh, they pay more in a month for energy prices than, you know, they paid all of last year. Uh, their, their gas has been cut to 9%. Uh, protests have taken place in Prague and Vienna and and I think they're protesting every Monday. Um, the, 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 the consequences of this, I mean, the, the working class can't take much more. Uh, inflation is out of control. In the UK, they're talking about an increase in energy bills of 80% by October. Um, and, and unfortunately, that's another issue, the bankruptcy of the left, uh, which is surrendered to support Biden in the United States and the Democratic Party, which in Europe would be considered a right-wing party. Uh, is seeding this kind of frustration and anger, which is legitimate, towards the neo-fascists. And not just here, but in Italy and Sweden and everywhere else. So it's a very short-sighted policy, and the consequences of this really could be catastrophic, both politically and militarily. They already are catastrophic economically. You see long-term consequences here. Could, could there be a comparison to when the U.S. funded the Mujahideen? <clears throat> fighters in Afghanistan in the 1980s? Well, the U.S. Is, is funding the proxy war on exactly the same idea. They're going to degrade and bleed Russia the way they did after the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. Um, there are always consequences of war that are uh, unpredictable. Uh, and, and uh, uh, you know, we have a major war in, in Europe. Uh, Russia has said that it, it feels it has a right to attack armed supplies that are 
uh, being uh, funneled into Ukraine. Well, what happens if they hit an arms shipment in Poland? Uh, we know uh, that large uh, segments of the weapons that are being shipped to Ukraine never reach Ukrainian fighters. CBS did a report on this. Other reporters have done it, although CBS, after complaints, uh, managed to take down its reporting. But uh, the, the, in that uh, report, they said that uh, they estimated only 30 percent of the arms were reaching Ukraine. Uh, and the rest are uh, snapped up by the black market and warlords. Well, who knows where that stuff's going to end up uh, and who's going to use it? And what are they going to use it against? A commercial jetliner? I mean, anything's possible. So it's, it's extremely short-sighted and, and cynical, uh, very cynical. And, and of course, the people who, who are paying for it at this moment with their lives are the Ukrainians and, and, and Russians, too. I mean, the Russian families, these poor cons, conscripts who were shipped off to Ukraine, certainly at the beginning, they didn't even know they were going to a war. Chris Hedges has been our guest. Chris Hedges is the author of the new book, The Greatest Evil Is War. He also has, I want to add, the Substack page. That's what, chrishedges.substack.com? Yes. Everything comes out on the Substack. The show comes out. The columns come out. So that's kind of Chris Hedges central at the moment. All right. So again, chrishedges.substack.com. Chris Hedges, thank you. Thanks, Mitch.